study on healing, and I trust you wrote your Bibles, and uh, we're just going to get right, in, get right into the study of it tonight. Last, last uh, Sunday, we, or last Wednesday night, we talked about God's redemptive <coughs> provision, and it was the healing, as well as the um, salvation for our souls. He provided healing as well. Um, but as I was thinking about that today, and, and we wonder why so many people don't teach healing, is that they're not convinced that it's part of the package. You know, people are just not convinced that it's part of the package. They feel like that, you know, if they get saved, then they just have to put up with whatever comes along in their life. They don't, you know, really, they pray, you know, Lord, if you're your will, heal them. If it's not, take them home. Well, I don't really want somebody praying that prayer over me. Um, you know, I'd rather them just pray the word of the Lord on me. And the ultimate decision would be the Lord, but, you know, don't don't be praying in order to get me out of here. This, you know, um, we, we had a, kind of a funny situation that happened years ago over in the, the little church. Uh, now, people would get up and, you know, give their testimonies, and, and then this... Uh, um, man got up and he was thanking God that he gave him cancer. So this other man stood up and said, uh, well, God just give him a double portion of it. If you're going to be thankful for it, then just get a double blessing. <laughs> well, thank God Pastor Jump right in the middle of that one cleared it up. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, pe people don't understand. You know, if, if you ever have a situation where you are in a real challenge of your life, death, life, and death situation, and you learned a lot from it, I mean, God, in that process of time, you you really went after God and sought God and you got close to God and God revealed a lot of things and you all developed a greater relationship, that's wonderful. But when you come out of it, you can be thankful for the time that you had with God, but... You know, you could have been there already and you didn't have to go through cancer to get there. Wow. You know, people don't understand that. So when, if you do that, please don't get up and thank God for it because he might say, well, if you're thankful for that, well, let me try you with another one. Oh, now, I know God's not that way, but the enemy is listening too. Oh, yeah. And uh, then when the challenge comes back, you don't know what kind of spiritual state you'd be in or what the circumstances are. So if that situation ever does occur in your life, then be thankful for what God did, but not for the purpose, I mean, not for the, the reason that you, the other people think it's for the cancer or something else. Just don't thank God for, for bad things. Just thank God he's, he's the victor in all of that, is what I'm trying to say. All right, so we talked about God redempt his provision, and we've got to realize that for sin, he provides forgiveness. You know, and, and even the Bible says, you know, after we start walking with God, once we get... All, when we come to know the Lord, then our sins are forgiven. Our, our sin nature is changed. And then as you walk with God, you're growing. You're in a process of growth. And as you grow, you learn to develop more spirituality in your life and more God consciousness in your life. And you start laying aside things. And you may have served Him for 40 years before you really come to some... Uh, uh, really a realization that there's some things in your life that you shouldn't be there and you come to know God in a greater measure and then you start laying down things. We're all in a process of, of being changed by the power of God daily. Right. The Word of God, revelation, understanding. Uh, we've not arrived. None of us have arrived. If you think you have, then uh, maybe I need to pray to the Lord and just, you know, put you on up there with Him. But we're all in the process of being been uh, going from glory to glory, strength to strength, faith to faith. And, and I'm thankful that we can grow. I'm thankful that we can understand more of God. And, and God is so vast and so big, I don't, I don't think that most of us will learn a whole lot about Him until we get there and see Him face to face. I don't care how knowledgeable and how much of God we know or how spiritual we may think we are. I can guarantee you when you get there, you're going to find out that you knew a little of what he's a whole lot about. And you know, when I, I preached a Sunday night about God, and uh, 
uh, you know, after all, I am God. And I, I tried to go to the Word of God and show you how great and how vast God really is. But this week as I meditated on that, did you know that God, who He is, and the essence of who He is, is as big as He is? When the, when the Bible says God is love, then love is as big as God is. And you cannot describe Him. He said, who do you compare me to? How can I be equal to? And we, we as human beings cannot even comprehend the vastness of that love. Mercy, compassion, understanding uh, of someone who loves us that much. It's, and I think that's why a lot of people don't serve God, really, because they don't understand how great His love is. And how great His compassion and His mercy is. Uh, we, like, we have a tendency to view God from um, the standpoint of where we conceive. Uh, us to, it to be, and rather than how God sees it from His viewpoint. And uh, I heard somebody um, wrote a song one time from heaven's point of view. You know, it's a whole lot different from heaven's point of view, I guarantee you, than from the natural's point of view. But God provides forgiveness for sin, and for when we die, He provides eternal life. We don't. The Bible says you don't die. You just, you know, you just change. Um, residence and you just keep living but even though the body is dead then the spirit's alive because of him and for sickness God provides healing uh, you know when we got saved that did not change the fact that we're in a natural body so we along with having to learn how to live to walk with God in a relationship of salvation we had to learn to believe his word for our daily needs our healing and everything. And, and a lot of people just think, well, if God wants to heal me, if he'll heal me, if he don't, you know, I'll just either get well or die. Well, that's not really how God wants you to view that. God wants you to view it from the fact that salvation is a covenant relationship that includes healing, spirit, soul, and body. It's all in the package, okay? But we're going to go into um, the revelation of God's will concerning healing. A lot of people don't pursue it because they are not convinced that it's God's will. And then they may even read the scripture. And they even read in Matthew about how Jesus went about healing everybody. But are we convinced totally and completely that healing is for us? If we're not, then chances are we're not going to get it. But if we're convinced, if we're persuaded that he is able... To keep that which we committed to him or do that which we ask of him. And you know, we, we, we studied this. We talked about uh, doubt or unbelief is really just an insult to God. Because it's really telling God, you know, I really can't quite grasp this. I, 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 you know, you might can do it, but I don't believe you can do it for me. And the important thing is that we can know it, that he will do it for us. God's will concerning Healing. Let's let's talk about it. It's revealed in four ways in the scriptures. And one, God declared. Let's let's turn to Exodus chapter fifteen. And um, God declared that that He is our healer. He He, de he declared it. Um, and I want to take you there. And we we may stay there for a little bit because I found something very interesting that that I want to share with you on that. And that's why I was trying to run back in my office and. Get it printed out. Um, all right, let's look to uh, Exodus chapter 15, and let's look at verse 22. The children of Israel are now journeying from Egypt, and they have made several stops along the way, and this is about the fifth stop, but they've crossed the Red Sea now. And as they cross the Red Sea, they have just come across, and they have just had that glorious uh, celebration of victory. Uh, Miriam, the prophetess, the Bible says she, the sister of Aaron, she took a, a, a timbrel, or a tambourine as we call them, a, a, a timbrel, and she began to march, and all the women begin to march, and they begin to shout victoriously about the horse and the rider is thrown into the sea. They, they sang that song of victory. Now, they've just come off of a huge victory. I mean, I'm talking about the waters are, are back. They're going across on dry land. And they just stood and watched their enemy get defeated. Now, wouldn't that be cause to believe God? I mean, you could just think, my Lord, if he can do that, he could do anything. But now, three days later, they're murmuring and complaining. 
Now, isn't that amazing that people are that way? Three days after the miracle, they're murmuring and complaining. And so he brought them into the wilderness of Shur, and as they went three days in the wilderness, they found no water. And when they came to Amara, Mara, they could not drink of the waters, for they were bitter. Therefore, that's why they call the name Mara. And all the people murmured at Moses, and what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And this is what he said. If, this is a big if, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, in the Lord's sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for he made this statement, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now when Moses was called of God and he and was told to go to deliver his people from Egypt, he asked God, he said, who am I going to say sent me? And he said, I am that I am. So he now he is identifying that I am. And one of the great things that he told him was, I am the Lord that he let thee. Well, let's go back and look at this story here just a little bit more and glean a little bit more from it. They're now needing water, and the water the waters were bitter. Uh, another translation says they were poisonous probably stagnant, poisonous, or whatever they were, they knew that the water was not pure enough to drink. And so they said, here's water, but we can't drink it. And so Moses said, God, what am I going to do? And the Lord showed him a tree. Very interesting. He showed him a tree, and he said, take this tree, throw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet or clean and pure enough to drink. Uh, when we look at that spiritually, we know the, what the tree represented. It represented the cross. We can go from bitterness to sweetness. James talked about people couldn't bring forth bitter and sweet water out of the same fountain. Well, the cross is, is what changes that, our bitterness to sweetness. So when we're living for God and serving God, then what's in us should not be bitterness. Poison is not necessarily something that you ingest through the mouth or through uh, other means, but poison can be in the spirit or in the soulish realm. And that's the cutting tongue, the, the, the sharpness and, and the, the unkindness and, and the ugliness, so let me say that, in us, that in the human nature, that can be poison because that can be detrimental and hurt and kill and destroy and James went on to talk about the tongue, what a deadly thing it was, and how it could hurt us. So we need to be careful. So we know the cross here represents the cross that Jesus hung on. Uh, also, it represents uh, something greater than, than, I'm not going to get into the depths of it tonight, but in Revelation, it talks about the tree of life, standing by the crystal river of waters that proceeding out of the throne. And on that tree, it bears all manner of fruit, each one, different months, for the healing of the nations. So there's something about a tree that brought healing, and the cross brought healing to us, and we need to understand that. The cross, is, so to speak, has been uh, thrust into our bitterness and brought out the sweetness so that we can live a life that, that's far above the bitterness of this world. But I ran across something that I just thought I'd just share with you uh, in, on this. There is a tree today that's called the Moringa tree. Moringa tree. Um, it's actually used to purify water. This tree, um, if I can find it here real quick, I did this real quick, so um, uh, it's one of the remarkable, useful trees. Is one being cultivated heavily for use in the Sudan. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations said that village women had successfully used the tree to cleanse the highly uh, turbid waters of the River Nile. After trying other uh, Moringa species in Egypt, uh, Somalia, Kenya, and other, other areas, 
They too have shown properties that clarify water quickly. When the Moringa seed are crushed and poured into a pot or bottle of dirty water, the water runs transparent within seconds. The seeds' antibacterial properties can turn low, medium, and high uh, turbidity waters into tap water quality in an hour or so. This is a tree. The studies on the effectiveness of the Moringa seeds for treating water have been done since the 1970s. This is not something that just come up. And have consistently shown that the Moringa is especially effective in removing suspended particles from water with medium to high levels of muddiness and dirtiness and just, just really bad water. It clears it up. Um, it says um, in uh, high turbidity, whatever that means, uh, uh, water needs only one of the ho horse reddish smelling seeds for effective treatment. Only one in a litter of water. Just one to make it right. In low, it seeds may do four liters. One seed could do four liters. Uh, when the water is boiled, this increases its effectiveness. Uh, the, the moringa tree is now widely cult cultivated uh, and is native only to the southern foothills of the Himalayas, but it has been grown wonderfully elsewhere in dry, sandy soil and it tolerates poor soil. It can grow to a height of about 10 meters. Apart from Africa, moringa trees are being cultivated in India, Sri Lanka, Guatemala, Mexico, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and elsewhere. In other words, they're planting these trees all over for purifying the water. Uh, they're now growing them in Australia. And so they're not saying that that was the tree that was there because the Bible says that God showed Moses a tree. Now, God could have just put a tree there because he knew they were going to get there in the waters. He could have done that. So I'm not trying to say that this was the tree that was there. But it could have been the tree. It could have been the tree. And the reason why I say is because God wants us to take advantage of the natural things he's already put here. He wants us to make available to us the natural things. Uh, to eat the right things and, and to allow the things that he's already put here. Because your body actually has been created by God and equipped to heal itself. What Jesus did on the cross was guarantee our right to be healed. He guaranteed our right to be healed. And so there's things that, that he uh, uh, may even have you do. All right. Um, the bark, the roots, the fruit, the flowers, the leaves, the seed, and gum are used as an antiseptic and medicine to treat rheumatism, bites, and other ailments. The seed pod has been used um, to... <coughs> Bring seawater to pure water. The barks and the roots are used as a spice and in soap. Seed oil is used in cooking, uh, machine lubrication, and cosmetics. The wood is used for fences and firewood. The flowers also are used in religious festivals, churches, and to decorate houses. Powdered moringa is used in cakes, fish feed, and cattle feed. And it goes on to say, and I'm looking for the part that it says that... Um, um, what, what is actually how much is uh, vitamins are in it um, it's amazing how many, how many vitamins are in this let me see if I can oh here it is right here almost every part of this tree is useful the leaves are inexpensive and are used in soups and with meat chicken and vegetable dishes the leaves are somewhat like spinach in both looks and a nutritional value. Let, listen to this. Fresh leaves have four times the calcium of milk, seven times the vitamin C in oranges, and four times the vitamin A in carrots. They are used in tea, soup, and porridge. So I, I just thought that was interesting uh, that, that this could have happened. In other words, they're not saying that this was the tree. But when you think about the natural resources that God has actually given us here, there's things that God will give us to use to provide healing, sanctification, and purification. But the most important, the spiritual aspect was that there was a tree. And Jesus hung on that tree, and he provided for us yeah. our healing. So God's own pronouncement, God's own proclamation says, 
I am the Lord that healeth thee. He promised help and healing. And then he also went on to say, look what he said in here. Um, he made the water sweet for him. Uh, if they had drank that water, they would have become sick. Probably many would have probably died. Because we know when you get a hold of contaminated water, uh, it, you can keep me, you know, it can kill you. You can get really sick. Uh, we know a lot of people who died by not knowing that the water was full of bacteria that they shouldn't be drinking. But he said to them, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that he the thief. I was at a um, church one time where this missionary came from um, South America, down around Argentina, somewhere in that, that area there. And she had been raised by a, a, a pastor, or her dad was, was a pastor, a minister of God, or he, he was a very, very uh, Bible-believing man. And she said she never had one childhood disease. She never was sick a day in her life because her dad, every day, would pray over this prayer. You said you would not put any of the diseases upon us or my children that... You know, it was up on uh, the Egyptians. Any of those diseases, they're they're not they're not for my my daughter, not for my child, and she never was sick. Now, isn't that a testimony for someone who's that strong in faith and believe the word that much to pray that their children would never have not even mumps or measles or anything like that? That was when they were. That's before they give all the shots now, and most people don't even have them. But back then, you know, we we were all getting them when we were growing up. So he took the word of God literally and applied it. He believed it. He was convinced that the word of God was true. And that's, that's what I want to emphasize tonight. Because if we're not convinced that healing is part of the total package, we will not go after our healing. And the only way you're going to, you and I are going to have to go after it is through the word of God. We've got to remind God of his promises that his word is true. And if we believe it. Well, let's go back. He said... There he made a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Three things he did. He set it up. Um, and, and when you study those words out in that situation there, he actually set up a remedy. A written authorization is what that is. That's when you study about the statute there, the ordinance, and there he proved. When you really study that out and you find out that actually God says, I'm giving you a written order, a written prescription. I'm going to tell you how you can guarantee your right to be healed. That's exactly what that's talking about. It was an authoritative order of command, spoken, written, communicated on what they needed to do. And he said, here's the prescription. If you will follow this prescription, I'll guarantee you that I'm your healer. Has it changed? Has God changed? No, he hasn't. So what do we have to do? We have to diligently do what? Hearken to the voice of God. Now the voice of God is the written word. We have to believe it. We have to believe that God is speaking to us and be convinced totally and completely. As Paul said, I am persuaded. And if we're not persuaded, if we're not convinced that it's part of the package then there's enough doubt to keep you from receiving it. But if we are totally convinced, he has a written prescription. This is like you go to the doctor, and the doctor writes you out a prescription, and he hands it to you. You can throw it in the trash can on the way out, or you can go get it filled. You can even get the medicine and set it up on a shelf at the house and never take it. And, it, you know, none of those things are going to be effective for you. You know, why did you even go? Why did you get the prescription? Why did you go pay money to get it filled? And you set it up on the shelf and it doesn't do you any good. Well, that people do the same thing with the Word of God. They read it. They even speak it. They even try to decree it, declare it. But are they convinced in their heart? Because out of the heart is where you believe. You've got to believe in your innermost being that this is part of the package. If we're not, it's not going to work for us. 
if we don't take the medicine that's prescribed, then it's not going to work, right? Amen. So he says, if you will diligently go hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and you do that which is right in whose sight? In his sight. Not, not your neighbors, not your pastors, not, not your husband and wife, or not, you know, you're not, you're not trying to uh, prove anything to anybody. You just need to do what's right in the sight of God. If you do what's right in the sight of God, I can guarantee you God's going to notice. All right. So we do what's right in His sight, and then do what? We give ear to His commandments. There are com commandments that, that God says that you keep all. The word all means every one of them, not it? All of His statutes. He said, I will put none of these diseases upon these. So I believe that when we walk with God with a humble heart, completely yielded to Him, completely given to Him, I believe that He has guaranteed our right to be healed, to live a happy, productive life. We're going to naturally age. And we're going to talk about this before this is over with. There's a natural aging process. What do we believe for in the natural aging process? Because, you know, as you get older, you say, well, you know, a lot of people, when they get aches and pains and groans and grunts, uh, you know, they say, well, it's just this old body getting older. Well, are we going to settle for an old body <laughs> and, you know, and give up? Or are we going to say, Lord, you know, there's, there's provisions in the Word of God for me as I get older. Uh, and we, we're going to look at some of those. We're not going to get into that tonight. So the Lord, by, God, by His own proclamation, uh, said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. In the book of 2 Kings is the story of, of um, Hezekiah. Let's, let's turn there just, just for a few minutes. In the uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20. In those days when Hez was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus said the Lord, Set your house in order. You're going to die and not live. Now, if anybody come and told you that, and the prophet, then I imagine you'd be making your funeral arrangements, or I would probably too. But Hezekiah said, mm -mm, Now, wait a minute. I'm not accepting that, even though it's coming from a prophet. So he turned his face to the wall and prayed and said, I beseech you, Lord, remember. So you have a right to, to talk to God about your situation. The doctor may give you a death sentence. You may have a death sentence pronounced on you. You can accept that death sentence and make your plans to die. Or you can go to God, just like Hezekiah did. Turned his face to the wall and prayed and said, Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Yeah. You see, he had something to bring to God. He, he had his faith. He had his walk with God. He said, now God, let's, let's talk about this. <laughs> I've walked before you. I've done that which is right. I've done what you've asked me to do. And according to your word, just what I've read, he had the promise. It was given back when, when they came out of Egypt. I'm sure that he, he just pretty much told God, look, you just said in, the, in the Exodus 15, 26, maybe it didn't have that title or that name or that chapter or whatever, but I'm sure they had it written down. And he said, I've obeyed your commandments. I've walked in your statutes. I've kept your ordinances. I've done everything that you've asked me to do. He said, now God, I, I believe that I have the right to be healed. And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone to the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him and look how quick he answered him. Go back and tell him I'll give him 15 more years. You see, we have the right to bring the word of God to the Lord. You have the right to do that. Now, there was a reason that God was going to do that. And we won't go into the life story after that. Because something happened, we won't get into that. But we have a right to go to God and talk to God about our situation. 
And, and it's not that you can bring your goodness before God or your righteousness before God. But if you've obeyed God, if you've obeyed Him, if you know you've walked with a clear conscience before God, you know that you've done everything within your power and ability to allow God's righteousness to be effective in you and me, then we have a right to go to Him and say, Lord, I believe Your Word. I have walked according to what You said, and therefore I believe that, that I have the right to be healed. And I'm convinced that You took my infirmities and You bore my sickness, and now I thank You that I'm healed. Thank You that I'm healed. That God guaranteed the right. So God's own proclamation, Psalms 103, verse 3, Pastor loves that scripture, said, you know, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. So we've got the word of God, right? God said it. All right, now, let's go to uh, the second thing that we have is the ministry of Jesus. Jesus, who was God incarnate or God in the flesh, expressing all that God was to his people, he was the exact representation, Hebrews said. He was the, the expression of God, the exact expression of God. He comes along and he begins to heal all that was sick, all that was diseased, and to cast out devils. We, we'll just get a few of them. Let's just turn it over to, to the, the New Testament and we'll just get a few of them here uh, just to show you what, what he's talking about. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So he come along expressing God's love and care for all people. And he said, I'm here to preach the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven has come among you. And he, and he began to heal and he began to deliver a people from all of the sicknesses and the disease. Um, look at Matthew chapter 8. We covered that just recently, but we'll skip over just a couple of chapters here to Matthew chapter 8. And um, 14 and 16, it says that um, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lay in sick of a fever. And he touched her hand. And the fever left her, and she arose and ministered to them. And when the evening was come, they were brought him that were many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out all the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So we have God's own pronouncement or proclamation. Then we have the ministry of Jesus. And he shows us that it's God's nature, God's will, God's desire that we be healed. But we must ourselves go for it. it it's not going to happen just because it's written in the Word. It's not going to happen just because the church you attend believes it. It's not going to happen just because you think it. You're going to have to believe it in your heart and declare it and decree it and be convinced that it absolutely will. And there's no formulas that you go by. You just believe the Word of God. Now, there's believers. If, you're, if you have enough faith to come... And come and say, look, I, I need healing. I need the believers to agree with me for healing. And you can't go by how you feel right then. It doesn't matter whether you feel that you're healed or you don't feel that you're healed. That's right. You've got to believe that when you pray, you receive. That's what the scripture says. That when you, you know, you pray, you receive it. You believe that you have it. Well, we... We've taught this, you know, all these years we've been taught this. But if you don't believe it, it will not manifest. Okay. I remember one time when, uh, uh, many years ago, uh, I've, I've had problems with my back off and on, and I had just happened to 
pull my back out and I could hardly get around. And uh, uh, past, I was married, at, Bill and I were married at that time, and he uh, was at uh, guard camp, I guess, or somewhere. Anyway, I got up that Sunday morning and I said, Lord, I'm finding me a Bible believing church because <laughs> I can't stand this pain anymore. And uh, uh, so we, I went. I knew this. I knew I happened to knew this this uh, uh, young man who was preaching there, and so I went there, and I I didn't care who was there or whatever. When when it was over with, I went up and I said, "You need to pray. Something's going on with my back." And uh, I walked out of there in as much pain as as stiff as I did when I went in. But this is what I did. I said, God, I obeyed your word. You said if there's any sick, let them call the elder church. My back's messed up. But I obeyed your word. And I believe. And it was actually pain was shooting out my elbow. That's how bad it was. I remember the sharp, shooting pains even coming out my elbow. And I said, you said if I would do that, then I would have healing. I got up the next morning and I was well. So you see, you have to declare, and I knew when I got prayed for, I was going to walk away. The healing manifested, not at that moment, but within 24 hours, I was perfectly healed. Uh, did it ever happen with my back again? Yes, several times. Went back to the same fountain, drank from the same water, and got the same healing. And if it happens again, we'll keep doing the same thing, because just because you get healed one time, doesn't mean the enemy's not going to try to come back. And do something else again. But, but you have to constantly keep the Word of God alive in your heart. Just like pastor teaches faith all the time. Why? Because we have to feed on it. We have to constantly feed on it. Alright, so two ways. One, God's own pronouncement that He's our healer. Jesus come along and demonstrated His power to heal. And His willingness to heal. And I think a lot of times that's where we get hung up is that we don't realize that God how willing God's a, a, a God is to heal. He's more willing to heal than we are to receive it. Because he's already bought it. He's already paid for. Yes. It's not like you're going to have to go up there and try to convince God to do something for you because he's already done it. Right. It's already bought and paid for. You know, it's, it's just like uh, you've heard the story and I know someone personally that did this. Got on the ship. They were going to take a cruise. And, uh, you know, I mean, they, they lavish you food on you. I mean, there's food everywhere. And once you buy the ticket, everything on that ship is available to you, right? All the food. You know, you go in. You don't have to, uh, you know, pay for the check on the way out or anything like that. Well, it was all incorporated in the, in the, uh, the ticket price. This person went up and they saw all the good food that was available and so they got a hot dog instead of a steak. And so they asked her, said, why are you getting the hot dog instead of the steak? She said, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I have the money to pay for it. She said, it's already paid for. All you got to do, she threw a hot dog away and went and got the steak. You know, and I think we all need to do this. We need to throw the hot dog away and go for the steak, you know. Let's go for it because it's already bought and paid for that we might... We have total, it's a complete package. But we have to pursue it. I, I'm going to have to tell you that we have to go for it. We have to pursue it. Yeah. Alright, the third thing is that it was provided for in Christ's atonement. Isaiah 53, we've been covering these scriptures. Matthew 8, 16, 17, we just read those. 1 Peter 2, 24, said himself, you know, took our infirmities and bore our sickness and by his strength. Right? We are healed. So, there's a word of God in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So we have three testimonies right there. That it's in the atonement. He completed the process when he said it's finished. Spirit, soul, and body. He completed it. So, uh, you know, uh, sickness, sin and sickness were like twin giants. That separated us from God. But aren't you glad that forgiveness and healing... Takes us right back into the presence of God. Defeats sure. those other giants. Come on. Uh, and Jesus did it by the cross. So if we'll just press on. In faith and humility and love. Go for it. Just go for it. Okay. Your pathway to healing may not be the same pathway I take. Because we all. Even though we are, are bought with the same price. Are redeemed by the same 
uh, way through the atonement, through the blood. Um, you know, we, we, we each have our own individual relationship with God. We are all on different levels of faith and different levels of knowledge. There's also always somebody that probably doesn't have as much faith as you or as much knowledge. And there's always somebody that's got more faith and more knowledge. We're just, that's the way we are. That's the body of Christ. But aren't you glad that's why we're a body? Because if your faith may be challenged at that time, then thank God for somebody else in the body of Christ that's strong enough to balance it out. And so by us joining faith to faith, uh, that gets the job done. Because that's where he said, if two of you will agree yes. as touching any one thing, it will be done for you by my Father which is in heaven. So when you have that prayer of agreement, then God says, I'll do it. When you can agree, I will do it. So when, when the sickness and, um, and, and sin brought death, then we have the provision of of forgiveness and deliverance and healing that brings life to us. Anything that, any kind of a sickness or disease or infirmity or challenge to your body, it's death working constantly on us. Anybody know that? Aging is, is, is death working constantly. I mean, you're headed for death. You may live here perfectly healthy, 100%, but I'm telling you, Death is your destiny, or the rapture, hopefully the rapture, but, but if it's not, where we're headed, for the grave. From the day we're born, to the day we leave here, no matter how many years it's in between, if we live 970 years like Methuselah did, no matter how many years we live, death, that's what Paul said, the outward man is, is perishing every day. But the inward man is being renewed every day. But thank God for the provision of the cross that not only renews our inward man, the Bible says if the same spirit that dwells in Christ, that dwelt in Christ dwells in us, he will quicken or make alive these mortal bodies. So even though we're aging and going toward the goal that we're going to step over into glory one day through the doorway of death, thank God the provision is there to give us strength, to give us health, to restore health to us. If, if you've gotten sick and your body's been challenged, you've gone through uh, operations and you've gone through it, God's promise says, I'll restore health to you. I'll restore health to you. And it doesn't matter what age you are. He didn't put an age limit on it. He didn't say, I'll restore age, your, your health if you're a teenager. Uh, hey, you can be 101 and be strong and healthy. But we know that death is working. Paul said, we know that. But life is working on the inside. So that life that's on the inside of us brings life to the flesh. But we got to let it work. Paul said it talks about the power of God working in us depends on the effectiveness of the life that, that's working inside us depends on us and how we let it work. We let it work. It's, it's about that tonight. That's what I wanted to get across to you. So the provision is in the atonement. Okay. And then the ongoing ministry of the church. The ongoing ministry of the church. Um, when Jesus sent out the 12, he commissioned them to go heal. He sent out the 70 and commissioned them to go and heal. When the apostle Paul come along, he was not one of the original 12. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 19 that God brought special miracles by the hands of Paul. He even had aprons and cloths and things that he wore. He would send them out to people and they would get healed. That's where comes our prayer clause today. We believe that if it worked for him, it worked for us. We anoint them, we pray over them, we send them out. Many testimonies have come back from a prayer cloth. Going out where it's been prayed over and deliverance has come. So it is the ongoing uh, obligation of the church to teach and preach and see that healing comes about. That's our responsibility. And then we don't to say, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let the elders pray over him. The prayer of faith will say the sick. You say, well, who are the elders? The elders were the leaders of the church. 
the pastors, and men of men of faith, women, whatever uh, that that God's. And then we have believers that lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So you don't have to be an elder in a church. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a prophet. All you've got to do is be a believer. If you're a true believer, you can pray for yourself, for your family, for people who come around, you know, and they say, you know, I'm sick and I need prayer. Just grab their hand and say, come on, let's pray. Because you're a believer. You're a believer. But as a believer, if you don't, if you're not convinced that God guarantees your right to be healed, then you're praying a double-minded way. You're praying and hoping. You can't pray and hope. You've got to pray and believe. Now, I'm talking about hoping in our sense. I'm not talking, the Bible hope is great expectation of something about to happen. Well, you've got to pray in faith and believe it. And what happens, the prayer of faith will save the sick. Um, God impart, imparted to us and gave the church special gifts that are, that are talked about in, in Corinthians. And, uh, and the church, the body, he gives uh, gifts of healings, uh, anointings, and, and so forth. But you have to exercise them. You have to use them. You have to be available for God to use you. A lot of times, you know, people are in intimidated. They're, they're afraid they're going to overstep their bounds or afraid they're going to be classified or this or classified. Folks, we just need to be believers. I mean, you're not going to do the healing. You're not going to. You're just, the result is not up to you. It's, it's, it is up to your faith. But the recipient, the person who needs the healing, must be a believer as well in this, in this sense. That you've got to believe that when you're prayed for, it's going to manifest. And that you have the right to be healed. So healing it is for, the, for us. Are you convinced that it is? Yeah. Are you convinced by the Word of God that it is? Yeah. Right. Not because I'm teaching it, but because the Word of God says it. Yeah. So you've got your battle won. If you're 100% convinced that healing is yours, then you've got a right to go for it. You're going to have to be like the little woman sometime that pressed through the crowd. Yeah. There was obstacles in front of her. Yeah. Your pathway of healing may not, that's what I was going to say a little ago, your pathway of healing may not be what mine. I might could just say, thank you, Jesus, I'm healed, and be healed. Yours, you might have to pursue it for several weeks or months. It might even be years. But are you going to give up? No. Are you going to go for it? See, that's, that's what I'm saying. And then, you know, I may get healed instantly on one thing. And then another thing I might have to, you know, press through. Uh, when you study the, the healings in the New Testament, you know, he he touched some, touched him. You know, he touched the man's blinded eyes and he could see, but one, he made him some mud and said, go wash. Uh, sometimes he just spoke the word and says, go your way, you're healed. Your daughter's made whole. Your son's okay. He, he used various things. Because he didn't have this set formula or pattern that he used, and neither can we, on every individual. Because really, just like salvation, you had to come to acknowledge Jesus as Lord of your life, as Savior. You had to come repenting of your sins and accept Jesus. You might have been sitting at home watching a Christian television. You might have been at home uh, just thinking, God, I'm so miserable. I'm just desperate. Maybe one ain't watching anything. And all of a sudden, you just felt a sense of, that God was with you, and you cried out, and God delivered you. You might have been in a church service. The altar call was given, and you came forward. Uh, different ways you found God. You, you might have been in different places, different, you know, different situations. We had testimonies of people being in you know, Vietnam and different, different places. The same thing with your healing. You will receive your healing at the point your faith makes contact. That's when it'll happen. I mean, you could be walking through your house and all of a sudden, your faith just rises up 
and you like a little woman, you just touch the hem of his garment, and the virtue flows through you, and you're totally healed. You might have been prayed for in every prayer line from Maine to Spain, as I say, and never got it. But the instant your faith touches him, virtue is going to come through your body, and you're going to be healed. So what I'm saying for you is, if you come up here and you get prayed for one time, two times, three times, a million times, whatever, and you don't get it, don't give up on it. And don't say, well, they don't have any faith there, because we do have faith. We do have faith. You have faith. I have faith. All of us have faith. But your pathway to healing may not come through the elders laying their hands on you. It may simply. You say, we're going to deal with this. What hinders our faith? What hinders us to get healing? We're going to deal with some of the things. And hopefully, you know, we'll get those out of the way next Wednesday night, and then you're going to have a clear road to get your healing. You know, the Bible said, talking about the little woman that pressed through and got her healing, she, she had already made up her mind. She said, if I can just touch his garment, I know I'll be made whole. If I can just touch him, I, did, I don't have to. He don't have to say nothing to me. He doesn't have to make a big issue over me. He doesn't even have to really recognize me. She said, if I can just slip up behind him and get a hold of his robe, I know I'll be healed. See, she knew. She knew it was for her. She knew. So what she did, she, she pressed her way through that and just reached up. But see, her faith pulled the virtue right out of him. And your faith will pull that healing virtue right out of him. And it, it's not about being great faith, you know, like, you know, I can boast about how much faith I've got. It's not about that. It's that instant when all of a sudden you run up. It's mine. It's mine. I remember the night that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Twelve years old. And um, I'd, I'd been, you know, praying. And, and we grew up in a Pentecostal church where you sought for it, which was it's a good thing. Which we get back to more seeking. But I I didn't have anybody praying around me. You know, people prayed for me. They paired with me, so to speak, and all that stuff. But it wasn't working. But I went and knelt down at the altar. And I just looked up with thanksgiving in my heart. And that's when the light from heaven just came down. I can still see in my mind that glorious light from heaven that just gloriously covered me. I could just feel it like it just started and just covered my entire being. And I said, Lord, this is it. This is it. I got it. <laughs> and suddenly, I flowed the language, you know, as the Spirit gave the utterance. So that's the, that's the kind of faith God's looking for, is that just knowing, that knowing that it's done, that knowing that it's done. But you've got to be convinced that it's for you. If you're convinced that it's for you, then it is yours. Amen.